page 258, please. 258. I like singing about hiding behind my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, Amen. And the world is so open. The flesh is so open. I mean, the world all around you, sin is so open. We just want to hide ourselves from that under the cleft of that rock, Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, we will skip verse 2 for time's sake. Verse 2 we'll skip for time's sake. Here we go. Oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of
Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the half has never been told. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful, what Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the half has never been told. From glory to glory he leads me on, from grace to grace every day, and brighter and brighter the glory dawns while pressing my Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the half has never been told. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful, what Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the Jesus has done for this soul of mine, the half has never been told. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful, what Jesus has done for this soul. of God's saints lifting up songs of praise to God rather than the clatter of the drums and that irritating sound of the electric guitar and some long-haired dude who I thought was a girl swinging around his head I like to hear the voices just the pure voices of God's children giving him the glory that he deserves I don't want to see the lights I don't want to see the flashy pictures I want to see the face of Jesus Christ when we lift up our voices to him thank God all right if our announcer can come forward and then give the announcements for us hello internet thank you for being here today thank you brethren for having me as you can see I'm kind of messed up and I got lots of errors I got I got some blunders <laughs> but uh, I am thankful and blessed to be here today. I will be doing your announcements. It'll be mostly the same, but you guys still need to hear it. <laughs> Next Sunday, we're going to have street preaching at the same corner with a Chevron gas station at 10.30 a.m. Uh, let's uh, win some souls and shout out some angry people next Sunday. Let's hear some Hail Satans because it means it's working. We hear um, Hail Satans, it's working. Uh, the discipleship will be at 7 p.m. Bible study at 8 p.m. at Pastor's Place. Um, if you need the address, make sure you reach out to Pastor and you get the address from him. Um, fellowship is going to be May 26th, and the place is undetermined. If anyone is able to open up a place, it would be a great blessing to all of us. So uh, let Pastor know if you could, if you can do that, and um, let also let Pastor know if there is a good, like a better date for you, just in case you cannot make it to the May 26th fellowship, we'll see if we can work something out because we want everybody to attend because you know what, we love you all. So we want to see all of you guys there. I'm going to read to you a really powerful testimony, actually. It'll test, it'll kind of show us or show you guys, especially that our internet ministry is not for naught. We have enemies attacking us for a reason. This brother actually had to say the same thing. So let's see what he says. He sent this um, testimony to Pastor via email. And it goes like this. Hello, Pastor Kim. I just wanted to reach out and say thank you for all your lessons. They continue to do wonders for me, and so, so has your resource link. 
Through the link, I found a BBC in my hometown and started attending two weeks ago, as you've taught. I surrendered myself to the pastor for discipleship, and he humbly accepted. Praise the Lord. I made him fully aware that I am an online disciple of yours and shared your video library with him. He was blown away, to say the least, and complimenting me for how much I have learned through your ministry. That compliment I gave to the Holy Spirit because you and I both know how much of a cesspool YouTube is. Amen, amen, and amen. Yet the Lord had mercy on me and graciously blessed me with your channel and teachings. And you, Pastor Kim, bless me every day by your playlist where I learn more and more and by sharing your church services. I have purchased the hymnal book and now I'm able to worship alongside my distant San Jose Bible Baptist Amen. Church family. Amen. We love you too, brother. Uh, every Monday evening. Thank you for that. It means a lot. It means a lot for us too. <laughs> now I get to have church twice a week. I have, that'll preach. Uh, I have registered with the American Bible College and I'm currently working through my first class general general Bible studies with Brother Royce to obtain my bachelor's in ministry. Wow. This decision was not made in haste. You taught me zeal can be a bad thing if not controlled. But after days of prayer, Pastor Bill Rowan's recommendation and a three-hour conversation with Brother Royce, um, not sure where the Lord is taking me, but I can say without hesitation, it's certainly better than anything I would plan. Amen and amen. This all thanks to your YouTube channel. You're probably wondering, why on earth is this man telling me all this? Well, Pastor, it's plain to see that you and your church are under heavy attack by Satan through comments, emails, and God knows what else. Amen. Uh, I lost my place for a second. <laughs> I'm sure at some point that can be very discouraging. It can be indeed. My email is to remind you of the powerful effect that the Holy Spirit has had on me and my family through your online ministry. Because of your uncompromising sermons, seeking of and submission to the Holy Spirit's power, my soul, my wife and children, my brother as of two days ago, and now four more of my friends and my family's souls are now saved. Amen. KJV only and dispensational Bible believing Christians. Your video, How to Be a Real Save Christian, Real Save Christian, along with my testimony, scripture you taught me out of Romans, and the Holy Spirit guiding my words, has been my method to lead souls to salvation. Once they accept Jesus as their personal Savior, I direct them to the video, Full Dispensational Teaching, so that they can understand how to read God's Word. Honestly, I hope they subscribe and binge watch the way I did after I got saved through your video, Superman versus Iron Man. Amen. I'm sure there's been days that you, you even considered stopping your online ministry just because of the grief it causes. I beseech the Lord that that day never comes so as long as you have breath in your lungs, Pastor, <laughs> an internet connection and a means to record and send God's messages out. It is because of your bravery in teaching God's word that I now have found bravery by means of the Holy Spirit to hand out chick tracts, ordered the 136 pack, amen, street preach in my downtown area and always have a concern for lost souls, which I never had before. Yes, it is definitely because the Holy Spirit has sealed itself within me, but credit must be given where credit is due. I understand that you do not like to take compliments because you are nothing but dirt and the Holy Spirit working through you is everything, but man to man, I must say thank you directly to you. Ultimately, you still have free will and could reject the Holy Spirit guidance and not do what you do. Amen, that's right. But your love and dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ overpowers any fleshly weakness, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. It is a great example for me, and I know your father, your pastor, and Dr. Ruckman, God rest his soul, are super proud of the pastor you have become. Watching all your videos, I feel as though even I have seen you grow, and grow you have in a very mature way. I hope this email reaches you well, and I hope that it re reinvigorates your spirit to continue preaching through your online ministry to followers like me and souls that are extremely lost, just how I was. We are in Satan's backyard, are we not? With that said, I would like to pray for you now. And he writes a prayer that says, Heavenly Father, blessed be your name. Thank you for your mercy and grace towards us, your children. I ask you to cleanse me of my sins and the blood, with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, as well as, my, as well as any sins of my brother, Gene Kim, so that we may be seen righteous as we pray to you. Father, I lift up my pastor, Pastor Gene Kim, to you, and I pray that you continue to bless him in his walk with you. We thank you, for fate, we thank you Father, for faithfully providing all of pastor's needs and the needs of his church. I ask that you fill Pastor Kim with the Holy Spirit and give him your divine strength, wisdom, and patience to defeat any and all demons, unclean spirits, devices, and people with the guidance and strength of your Holy Spirit. 
we can accomplish any, any and all tasks that you place before us. Thank you for saving our souls. Thank you for the multitude of blessings you bestow on us. And thank you for your unwavering love and grace. It is through your grace alone we are even able to live, love, and worship you, Lord. We love you, Father. We thank you for hearing our prayer. And I, and I ask all these things of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's a really good prayer. God bless you, Pastor Kim. Thank you for all you do and all that you will continue to do. You are a blessing to this world, but more specifically to me and my family. We thank you and know that we pray for you daily. Now let's get busy doing God's work. That brother's identity will be held confidential because I'm not going to give out personal information. But to all all of you online, we we encourage you to send you or send us your testimonies because, as you can see, it really reinvigorates us yes. and it encourages us because it can it shows us that we're reaching some people and it's really nice to see that. So, brother, thank you for sending me sending us your testimony, and um, now I'll pass it back over to Pastor. I hope this will be a blessing to you. I hope I don't slip up. We'll see.
champion of love, of love. That's my champion, and he will always reign supreme. Amen. All right, if Brother Caleb can come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us. And ask God's blessing upon the church with a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for saving us from hell, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, amen. 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 Thank you for the singing that we're able to sing for you. Thank you for the great uplifting, encouraging uh, testimony that we're able to receive. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. 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 Say in Kings chapter 17, please. Say in Kings chapter 17. You all pray together with me as I preach the Lord's word tonight, uh, today. There may be an evil spirit, as you may know. Sometimes there is an evil spirit that comes in Amen. in the middle of service and disrupts the service and so we want the evil spirits out, out. and we want God, the Holy Spirit, to take full yeah. and free reign in this room today. Second Kings chapter 17, and we will read verse 9. The Bible says, And the children of Israel <coughs> did secretly, it's always secret, those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen, to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their, uh, their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So you'll notice right here as we read this long passage from verses 9 through 18, we see that there are the children of Israel. They did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they did it in secret. And one thing I learned is this, is that you cannot hide your sin from God. A lot of people, they, they always like to try to hide behind the Internet, or they'll like to hide it through a cloak of piety and pretend that they're a Christian, that they're just a regular good Christian church member. Or the pastor will pretend, you know, with his outfit, that he's a regular and good pastor. But the thing is this, is that, that ugly verse says, be sure your sin will find you out. And as Jesus rightfully called, wolves in sheep's clothing. Amen. You can act like a Christian, and I am sick and tired of these people calling themselves Bible believers when they're not. And these people, when they put on this kind of cloak, outward cloak, the Lord will expose it fully, and you can't hide your sin forever. Today, I'm going to enjoy today's preaching. 
secret sins exposed. Let's pray. God, my Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and wash away my sins with your precious blood, as well as the rest of all of these people as well. I pray that uh, all the members and then the ones who come and go and the visitors who come in, I pray, Heavenly Father, that this sermon will be applicable to all of them, that it will be a blessing and that lives will be changed. You'll get the full glory. Heavenly Father, I need you more than ever before because Gene Kim is absolutely nothing without Jesus Christ. And I pray that Jesus Christ will take all in all so that he can take the full glory today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. My first point is the spreading of your secret sin. The spreading of your secret sin. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 through 11. <clears throat> and the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fence city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke. You notice right here it says provoke. It provokes the Lord to anger. I'll tell you one thing. You can hide it behind a cloak of covetousness and then pretend like that you're a good Christian and that there's nothing wrong. And you know what? It, it's true. If you go to a lot of churches, well, I would even dare say every single church out there, there's always some kind of Christian sitting and being in somewhere, as well as a preacher on the pulpit, that acts like everything's okay and no one knows about it. But one thing is certain is that be sure your sin will find you out. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Boom. And you're going to realize this is that you can hide it all you want. And I know this is that you can't hide it forever because what's in your heart Amen. It shows outwardly. It's so strange and it can be very scary too. You know that? It can be very scary too because I get sometimes some of these members, you know, who come to me and say, you know, pastors, there's something wrong with that person over there. Or, you know, pastor, there's something wrong with you today. Or pastor, you know, there's something going on with this church that didn't seem right today. And then, you know, I just get surprised, you know, because sometimes people will just come up to me and then just say stuff like that. And you know, one thing I learned is that what you have in your heart will be openly exposed, and you cannot hide it forever. Boy, I hear silence. You know why? Because some of you are getting scared and getting under conviction. That's good. That's good. That's good. And you know what? You don't have to be show off. You don't have to like show off yourself on the internet. You don't have to show off and advertise yourself to a bunch of other different pastors and churches. You don't have to do that because what happens is the good treasure that's in your heart will be outwardly shown. So, you know, if I talk about something controversial, and I know, you know, which subjects where I can lose people, you know, I don't care about that. Because, you know, if I'm going to teach the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and, you know, I'm not going to pick popular subjects where I can build up subscribers, like, you know, I have to be anti-Israel, and I have to believe that we're going to go through the tribulation so that I can join in all the other guys, you know, like Alex Jones and other post drivers and Ken Hoven and all those kind of stuff. I don't have to resort to all that kind of stuff. You know why? Because I know this, is that I don't have to parade myself to pretend that I'm the right guy or, you know, pick certain stuff. All I have to do is pick what the Word of God says. Amen. And when I pick what the Word of God says, and then I give it to them, then you know what? If the person's heart is right with God and wants the truth, then that person, he will heed and to the truth, and he will see that, you know, this pastor, yeah, it may sound crazy at first, but then you know what? There's something in that person's heart that's seeking after the truth, Amen. that's sincere. So you know what? I might just park over here a little longer and check it out a little more. And trust me, it will be exposed one day. And trust me, if anyone gets deceived by so-called Internet pastors, disgusting. Who would I have had a church to begin with had it not been the Internet? And you know what? We did fine without the Internet too, haven't we? We did fine without the Internet too. So you know what? It's a fact. Look, I don't get discouraged. I don't get depressed, although I'll be at honest sometimes because I'm flesh, 
that about church sizes, it's known that when we get closer to the last days, there will only be a small amount of people, small amount of people who genuinely and honestly want the truth. We are a minority, you gotta understand, compared to the majority of the world and the churches. I mean, Noah had only what? It was only total eight people, right? Yes. Only total eight people. I don't care about that. I don't care about that thing at all. But the thing is this, the thing is, is that we can do fine with or without the internet. We can do fine with or without a church building. We can do fine with or without offering. We can do fine because you know what? If your heart is sincere, right with God, and you want to win souls, and you want the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and you want to support the church, and you love Jesus Christ, it will show. That should be an encouragement, right? And you shouldn't get scared about that. If some of you are scared about that, then there's probably something you're hiding for your sin. But if your heart is right with God, you're going to get excited. You go, wow, praise the Lord. So I don't have to advertise in front of the Internet and then finally get attention. I don't have to you set up some kind of social group page. You know, I don't have to tell everybody that, oh, yeah, I'm a good preacher. Oh, yeah, I'm a good teacher. I don't have to do that because out of the, uh, from the heart, it's going to show one day. It's going to show one day. Don't worry about that. The Lord, you know, will take care of it. But guess what? If some of you are kind of nervous about it, what you're feeling right now, then you know why. Because there's something you're hiding. There is something you don't want people to see. And you know what? You can't hide it forever. And guess what? People may be dumb, but they're not really dumb as you think. You'd be surprised some will catch something eventually. You won't hide it forever. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. You can look at that verse if you want to. And there's a verse. There's an ugly verse that reads this. Be sure your sin will find you out. You know what that verse says? Be sure. Be absolutely sure. In other words, be very certain your sin will be found out. Oh, you can pretend, oh, I'm a Bible believer, I'm a Christian, yada, yada, yada. Oh, look at me. See, you saw me giving money. Oh, see, you see me, you know, like actually witnessing to somebody. Oh, you see me doing that. I believe the King James Bible is perfect like you. Oh, you can act like that. But trust me, be sure, be very sure that when you're hiding yourself, you actually say, you know what? I actually want to critique. You know what? I actually want to infiltrate. You know what? I want to actually steal sheep. You know what? I actually want to show off my stuff. You know what? I don't want them to believe in Bible-believing truth. I want them to believe in what I think is Bible-believing truth. And blah, 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 blah. Be sure your sin will find you out. You can't hide it forever. God will expose it. You think that you can hide your addictions forever? You think you can hide how you feel toward the person forever? Be sure be sure, be sure your sin will find you out. That's why it's best to repent, confess, and get right with God. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 21, it says, It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. You know, this verse says that one sin, it rises quickly. When you give a certain action of sin, it will rise quickly. You know what happens? What happens is, is that when you have this prideful and arrogant attitude, where you try to, you know, you try to pretend that you're all right with God, and then you come to church, and you've been coming to church for a long time, perhaps, you know. But you know, that's still infiltration. You know why that's infiltrating? Because you're infiltrating in, you act like everything's okay. But then when you're hearing the preacher and teaching, you go, ah, 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 ah. No, I don't like that. No, I don't like that. And then during fellowship, then you go, bah, 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 with somebody else, you know. You know what happens with that? See, then it rises. Then what happens then, then you get other people to join you. Then what happens that you get a, you need, you have to, you have to, otherwise you have no ministry. You have to have a bunch of trolls along with you and then putting all these kind of comments. And then that way you can discourage people from watching, discourage people from coming to a Bible believing church. And then that way people can see, oh, so the majority, even people can think that, that's actually right. That's actually true. You know, those people are right. You know, you're no different. Internet people, I realized, are no different from people watching news media. You know, because they're trying to go by what other people are saying. See, if everybody says amen, then you're going to naturally say amen. You know, That's good. I mean, let me give you an example. Okay. All right. 
Do you all believe in a pre-tribulation rapture that we will be raptured before the tribulation? Amen. Amen! See that? Yeah, there's one example right there. But if I say that you're going to go through the tribulation and then a post-trib rapture, you know, stuff like that. And then if everybody said amen, then you're all going to say amen too. You know, see, people go by majority what they see. You know, they, right. they look at all the comments. They will look at uh, all the stuff that other people are talking about in their workplace. School, amen. oh, teen pressure, right? Teen pressure, youth pressure, you know, following along with the crowd. And that's why you talk like them, you act like them, you even think like them. And then when you come to a Bible-believing church and hear the Word of God preached, and you know what happens? Then you go, oh, I don't like that. You know why? Because you're so used to what the majority crowd flows. And then what happens is then that sin rises and rises and rises. And then guess what? Then, oh my goodness, then what? You end up like one of those atheists, those liberals, those people who don't believe in Jesus, or even a sodomite, man. Sad, sad, unfortunate, and sad. Really sad. Oh, that ain't going to happen to me. Oh, go ahead, man. You don't, do you realize this flesh is unchanged? I mean, you all agree with that. This flesh is wicked. Romans 7 yeah. didn't change at all. This flesh is capable of doing the worst kind of sins. Unless you're a Calvinist said, you're a Calvinist and say, oh, it's impossible that I'm going to commit the sin of homosexuality. Go ahead and keep trying. And this flesh, man, what's going to happen is that it's going to lead you into darker and darker paths. And you're going to do stuff that you never even thought before. You never even thought before. You don't think that's possible? Of course it's possible. I've had some sodomites here, actually. One of them was even passing out tracts. And then he didn't even believe in calling them gay. He actually said queer. And then he passed them out. And because of that, the poor guy got arrested after that. But that guy, he conquered the sin of sodomy. He got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, but everyone, you'd be surprised, they are capable of doing the worst kind of things. Amen. The worst kind of things to begin with. Oh, I ain't capable of doing that. Go ahead and try that. What if you become like that? You know? Or what if your friends become like that? What if your pastor becomes like that? What if your wife becomes like that? What if your children become like that? What if you become like that? Oh, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. See, pride, pride, pride. This flesh, you underestimate that, and the devil is watching that, and the devil says, oh, okay then. Let's try something right here. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Scary, scary, scary stuff. Oh, it ain't going to happen. Well, what happens is this is like, let me give you a few examples. Like, didn't you notice that, oh, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You skip a few days of prayer, and then what happens? Turns into weeks. You skip reading the Bible. Then what happens? Turns into weeks. You don't come to church, and what happens? Turns into months and years. What happens when you don't keep growing in Bible-believing truth? Then you're going to grow in what you learn at school. That's right, and then you're going to grow more and more in school, and then in school, then they're going to feed you garbage. And because you're fed so much with garbage rather than the word of God, you're going to come out like some kind of atheistic liberal one day. Be careful, man. Little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. That's why you got to stick in being clean, in conquering sin, and growing in the word of God, and serving God faithfully. Your sin will be exposed. It gets more frequent, right? And it becomes darker and darker, Right? And then the, the first sign of bitterness now turns into obsession. The first sign of where it gets to, you know, hypocrisy acting pious. Now you're deceived into thinking like that and you act full-blown pharisaical, hypocritical. You see that? Be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. My second point is the stubbornness of sin. The stubbornness of sin. I can tell you're all enjoying this message, right? You're all enjoying this message. Verse 12 through 15. Verse 12 through 15. The Bible says right here, For they served idols, whereof the Lord hath said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways. And... Keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity 
and became vain, and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them, that they should not do like them. So you'll notice right here that in verses 13, uh, starting at verse 12, all the way through 15, the Lord at verse 13 just kept testifying to them, hey, get right with God, get right with God. And then you heard the preacher saying, hey, get rid clean up that sin, clean up that sin, clean up that sin. Hey, you know, believe, you know, the number one thing, which is pretty funny to me, you know, it's really funny uh, how majority of people leave church. Majority of people leave church not because their sin is pointed out, although it is true a lot of people leave, but because of a certain doctrine, see? They want to cling on to a certain heresy. And then when they hear some kind of doctrine that is taught or, you know, that I draw, that I draw jigsaw puzzles with, you know, then all of a sudden they, they get offended and they act like a little Pentecostal and charismatic, like, oh, but you can't tell me whatever I experienced was real. It's actually real. It's actually real. I just know so. I believe so. I believe so. We are the real Israel, for one example of a heresy. I believe signs and wonders exist, uh, for another example of a heresy. Oh, you know, dispensationalism, that is baloney and heresy. Different salvation plans, different dispensational salvations. No, no, no. See, already a bias set up what they were prone and grown to believe in. And because no matter, it doesn't matter which denomination whether Baptist or Catholic, every single human being has a problem of a biased mindset where, all, where they're all settled and done. And when the preacher or the teacher gives the truth, then they huff and puff and they act like little children. And they go, oh, I don't know, like that. The thing is this, is I see that stubbornness now. See that? It's no longer hiding the sin where your sin is spread out. It's not now that your sin is spread out. It's now to a point where it's hardened. It's stubborn. It's so true. For example, have you ever noticed that, or you yourself is guilty of that, because you were all once teenagers, whenever a parent would bring up something that's a problem, actually, or that's wrong, you ever notice, like, teens, they always like to deny what they're doing is wrong? Well, what's wrong with that? Especially if you're a Bible-believing parent and you raise your kid, right? Well, what's wrong with that? I see other Christians doing it. Oh, what's wrong with that? You notice that? You know what that is? See? That is the stubbornness of clinging on to what they want to do. Clinging on to what they want to believe in. Clinging on to what they want to keep in their houses and their homes. And you know what happens is when they deny, it actually becomes deceiving your own self. Didn't you know that? You ever notice that where you actually start to justify your wrongdoings and when you justify your wrongdoings then it starts to brainwash you where you think oh, you know I actually believe what I'm saying That's good. oh so you believe now what you're saying rather than the Word of God scary scary you know why because once the wrongdoing is exposed their pride is hurt and when their pride is hurt they stubbornly get angry at the person trying to show them the truth instead. Whether it be a member to a pastor, whether it be a child to a parent, uh, whether it be uh, somebody God has put as a position of authority in your life. You just don't make your sin secret to others. Didn't you know it includes yourself? You think that you're hiding your sin from others, don't you? But guess what? You're not only hiding the sin from other people. You can hide it all. You, you know what happens? Like, here's a great example. A great example of a person, like, hiding his or her sin, for example. They would co come to church, and they would act like, oh, you know, I'm actually not judgmental. You know, I actually love people. I actually have grace with the people. They would act like that. And then so they would hide it from other people, their judgmental attitude, right? And they would act like, oh, I'm loving, I'm gracious, you know, let's all help each other out, serve God together. But then what happens is, is that that prideful spirit and that judgmental attitude actually comes out. Because what happens is, is not only will it come out by the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, as that ugly verse that I showed you before, but also what happens is, let's say that you fool other people around you, including the pastor, including the greatest men of God, and you can hide it from everybody. Guess what happens? It's so wicked and so deceptive. Now, not only did you fool them, you even fooled yourself. Because now you fooled yourself into thinking, you know, I'm actually not judgmental. You know, I actually am loving and gracious and merciful. 
That's what happens, see? People act like, oh, I'm not being hypocritical. I'm not here to cause problems in the church and stuff like that. But what happens is, see, when you start to say that and you and people, you fool people with that, you even fool yourself. Amen. And then you come in every single Sunday and then you act like, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm not here to cause trouble. I'm not here to cause trouble. And then actually you are causing trouble. Mm. Wickedness, wickedness, man. I mean, if you're in a King James only dispensational Bible-believing church, man. I mean, set aside pride, man. Set Amen. aside that uh, judgmental, critical attitude, man, because sure. no one is perfect. All have sinned and come right. short of the glory of God. I don't hesitate to rebuke out false prophets and heretics, and I will continue to do so. And you've seen me doing that so many times. I don't hesitate to do that, and I believe you should do that too. But let me tell you something. If you're a King James-only dispensational Bible-believing church, I mean, what in the world, man? Then you're the only right pastor and everybody's wrong then. That's what happens. And you start your own little weird little cult and following. Like I said, I believe that it's going to be minority. Bible-believing churches aren't small. But trust me, it ain't that small where you're like the only person raptured, you think. Amen. It's not like that small where you think it's only one city. It's not that small where there's only 20 different churches around the United States, let alone the whole world. It's not like that, okay? Bible-believing churches were all around the world. But when you go to those churches, you're gonna see like 80% of them is gonna be small. So the thing is this, is that see, you don't want, you gotta be careful of that critical, prideful attitude. You gotta be careful of that uh, secret sin that you're hiding from others because you're then gonna not only hide from them you're gonna hide it from yourself and then where it becomes skipping Bible reading and you fool people about that you're gonna even fool yourself and you're gonna freak oh man when was the last time I read my Bible when was the last time that I prayed see sin deceives you not just others it deceives you yourself yeah, that's, good. that's why you know when people start to believe in a heresy uh, like one example for a heresy is like, you know, oh, you know, I don't believe. I do not believe that Jesus is God. I deny the deity of Jesus Christ. What happens is, is that that kind of sin where you have that arrogant pride and heresy and that wrong doctrine, what happens and then you even fool yourself because you're shown the verses, you're shown the truth, but then I guess you're too lazy to even look it up. And I guess because dispensationalism, like some people will whine, oh, it's a maze, it's a puzzle, they're playing mind games, you know? You know why? Because they're too lazy Amen. to study the Bible. And by the way, I get so many people who actually say, wow, this is actually eye-opening, not confusing. Amen. People who say they are too lazy to even look at the verse, that's their problem, man. So, you know, when you have that attitude... Where you're too lazy to even look at the verse and you oh, I don't like that, oh, I don't like that. Then you even fool yourself and you're going to go, dispensationalism is wrong. Dispensationalism is wrong. Oh, Jesus is not God. Jesus is not God. Or signs and wonders do exist. Let's speak in tongues. Blah, 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 like that. Yeah. You're going to have that kind of attitude. Young people, worldly people, sinful people are going to go, there's nothing wrong with smoking. What's wrong with, give me a verse that says about smoking marijuana. You know, give me a verse about uh, drinking alcohol. You know, give me a verse about, you know, uh, give me a verse about worldly music. There's no verse that says about electric guitar, percussion drum, or worldly dressing, or blah, 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 blah. See, that, that happens. Now you deceive yourself. And you believe what you're saying. Can you believe that? You're actually believing what you're saying. You know why? Because that's what stubborn and stubbornness does. It's like such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 20. I'm going to... Man, I parked a lot about these sins, man. But, uh, good. I, yeah, Amen. well, I'm going to actually have to cover some of these sins real quickly then. All right? But let's see that some of these sins, if you don't open your eyes and repent of it, it's going to become more frequent and it's going to be even darker. And one day it will have a heavy blow that will hurt you. And don't worry, it does, just doesn't hurt you. It hurt others around you. Let's say, for example, there's a certain addiction you're going through, whether it be drugs, whether it be something sexual. You are secretly committing those kind of sinful addictions. And if that's not repented of, 
then what's going to happen is then you're going to stubbornly deceive yourself that those sins are not really that wicked because everybody else is doing it. And when you talk like that, then you start to fool yourself. And then you fool yourself into thinking, you know, it's not really that wicked after all. And, ooh, it's getting quiet in here because maybe some people feel like that. And what happens is then you stubbornly deceive yourself and then you get one day judged by God. And when God judges you, you know what happens? People start saying, why did this have to happen to me, God? It's because you, you fooled yourself into saying, this is not really that bad, so I'll just keep doing this. I'll keep doing this. I'll keep doing this. That's what happens. Amen. That's good. Another thing is that people just don't want to serve God. They got a spiritual laziness. They skip Bible reading. They skip memorizing verses. They don't want to pass out tracts. They don't want to come to street preaching, soul winning. They don't want to attend church. They don't want to pray. And you got to be careful because if that's not repented of, then you're going to stubbornly deceive yourself that you're too busy or you're too tired, or you have good reason that you can't do those duties. And how long has it been since you fooled yourself and talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secrets? Ooh. What about anger? There are people who have a, a secret anger against someone. And if that is not repented of, then what happens is that you stubbornly deceive yourself and what happens is, is that uh, you stubbornly deceive yourself that you deserve just payment when you never thought about how much wrong you did to that other person and how God never got his just payment from your many wrongdoings. You know what I'm talking about? I'll give you an example because I've done fights, so I know what I'm talking about. When you fight with some, someone, you know what happens? I'm telling you how I feel, all right? And perhaps there might be some people who feel these emotions. When you fight someone, what happens is you feel like you're right. And what happens is when you have that emotion in the moment of fighting someone where you feel like you're right, all you can go is go by such emotions. And then when a person starts to argue back, then you continually argue. Then because that emotion is flowing at the rush of the moment, it just gets even bigger and bigger. And what happens and then it becomes more stubborn where it's implanted that I cannot be wrong, Amen. I'm right, and you keep looking at that person's fault, and you might be right about the person's fault, but you know one thing I learned after I discuss or talk or argue with somebody? You know what happens after that? I immediately self-reflect myself and say, Lord, was my heart right with you? Lord, was there something I did wrong? And then when I look back, then I go, you know, if I said it this way, you know, it's because yeah, I did misunderstand something. Oh, you know, and then when I do that, then I realize it's not all that person's fault after all. It's, it's actually either both sides or even entirely my own fault. Amen. That's what happens. See, that's what sin does, the sin of anger. It deceives you where you become stubborn. Rebellion as well. You secretly rebel against authority inwardly. And even though you listen outwardly and you go to church and you don't cause problems, if that's not repented of, you will stubbornly deceive yourself that, oh, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, because you only focus on the wrong things of the person in authority rather than on the right things, and you don't even look at your own wrong things. That's what happens. And you deceive yourself where you think you're better than some church member sitting next to you, where you're better than the pastor, or you're better than a lot of other Christians around the world. You think you're the Apostle Paul or something. You're going to start the new Bible-believing movement, the new fundamentalist movement, the new Baptist movement. See, that's what happens. And you become this cultic mindset, and you come unprideful, arrogant. And then guess what happens? I, trust me, this is what happens. I've seen southern churches, oh, really bad. What happens is when there's a church split, then the guy starts a church in the same city a couple blocks down the road. That's what happens. Worldliness, right? You secret do worldly things. And if that's not repented of, then you will stubbornly deceive yourself that there is nothing really sinful about them. And if you give them up, it's too restrictive and too boring. You know, you guys are too legalistic with the stuff that you watch on TV, on the internet, the way you dress, the way you talk with people and joke with people. 
the places you hang around with friends and the music you listen to and shall I go on and on and on? You know, it's especially embarrassing. It's especially embarrassing that, I, I kid you not, there are pastors guilty of that, okay? I, I've seen it in, I've been, I've been through many churches in my life, independent fundamental Baptist churches, and it's really embarrassing that you see pastors actually bringing up television-related items. And they will bring up television-related items. And they will use that. Now, I understand. Sometimes, you know, I'll do those things to, to illustrate a point to show the popular worldly thinking and how the devil could use those things or to teach a valuable lesson because some people don't understand that. But when you embarrass yourself, man, or you take some person's rap music or you take some movie theater's music and then you put it in in your own video clips. I kid you not, there are pastors who do that even on the internet. And they'll put like some kind of, you know, like Marvel heroes or DC heroes, you know, with them. And when, especially when you're a pastor, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And then, you know, the, another sin is the selfishness and the inconsiderateness of other people. There are people who secretly have a selfish and inconsiderate attitude of other people deep down inside their heart. That's why, why don't people tithe? Why do people keep judging others? Why do people bring tension to people in the way you behave or the words? And it's not simple. It's not simple. But you nevertheless bring tension to those people. Maybe you're too loose. Maybe you're too dry. Maybe you're too loud. Maybe you need to tone down the volume a bit. Maybe you're too soft, too quiet. Maybe you should talk a little bit more. But the thing is this, is that when people, because they keep thinking about themselves, well, that's just me, that's just me. No, you got to realize it's not just you. You got to think about other people around you. Now, this might be hard for you, believe, for you people to believe in, but this is very true. I get, a, I, I'm a very, like, a hidden person. I'm a, actually a very shy person. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> that's very hard to believe. Why? Because pastor talked to me. Pastor's the one, only one talking. Yeah, you know why? Because I'm thinking about other people. And when I think about other people, hey, you know, I got to make them welcome. Hey, I got to make them feel like they're part of the family. Hey, you know, uh, I got to make them see that fellowship is sweet. It's not about me. It's about other people. Because what happens is then you'll stubbornly deceive yourself. Well, that's just me. That's just me. And there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Then what happens is then pretty soon that behavior and words out of your mouth and the way you think, what's going to happen is you're actually going to unconsciously, without you knowing, burden and actually even offend some people because you're inconsiderate how they think, how they feel, because all you think about is yourself, how you think and how you feel. These secret sins will fail to include some people stubbornly stuck where it actually deceives them, such as covetousness, pride, discouragement, sensuality, bitterness, wrong imaginations, hatred, hypocrisies, lies. And in case some of you said, well, I'm so glad the pastor didn't mention about my secret sin. You know which secret sin you're messing around with. And you know exactly what God is speaking to you right now. You can't hide it. My last point, the selling of your secret sin. The selling of your secret sin. Verses 16 through 18. Verses 16 through 18. Boy, I bet you a, a lot of people want to get right with God after this message. Amen. <laughs> Amen. The selling of your secret sin. Verse 16. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Verse 18, therefore the Lord was very wroth, uh, was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. You know what happens right here? Now there's a selling of your secret sin. What happens in verse 16 through 18, you sold yourself completely. Verse 16, they left all the commandments of the Lord. Now that's what happens. 
Now you sold yourself clean out completely to that sin, and you think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and nothing will change your mind about that. That's what's going to be happening. Whether it be smoking marijuana as an outward sin, or an inward sin of a heretical belief, such as being a post-trib. So it doesn't matter which one. What happens is now you sold yourself out completely. There's practically no hope because you know who your master is and you bought yourself to that master. And it's too late. Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto where? Death. Or of obedience unto what? Righteousness. I'm going to tell you something that once you sell yourself out to sin, guess what? You completely sold yourself out. It gets deeper and darker. Your heart is hardened and nothing will change your mind. Not even the chastening rod of God, which he's been beating in some of you for a long time now, that you should have plainly seen. You don't care. And you will give the worst thing you can ever say. The worst thing you can ever say is, oh, I'm suffering for Jesus. Oh, I'm being persecution. You should self-reflect yourself before you do. I even do that even after I teach. Don't you know that? Don't you know that? I even do that even after I teach. I'm like, you know, maybe I did something wrong right here, maybe, and then I'll pray and study the word. And you know, that's a good thing to do because when you, if you, what you teach is the truth, and you have that sincere, soft heart where you're studying the word more, then what's going to happen is your faith gets implanted even more on a certain doctrine or a certain action or a certain thought. If you think that you have not sold yourself out to the sin, let me just a ask you a simple question. Did you sell yourself out to the sin probably yet? You might say, I, I don't think so, Pastor. Well, think about this. How many secret hours have you spent for Satan compared to God. That's good. Who's your master now that you're spending your time serving? Here's another question. How many secret times have you used your mouth for Satan compared to God? How many secret times have you used your mind for Satan compared to God? How many secret times have you used your eyes for Satan compared to God? How many secret times have you used your feet for Satan compared to God? How many secret times have you used your hands? Shall I go on and on and on? I think now you're convinced by now who you are probably sold yourself out to. How many secret times you skipped your spiritual duty for God compared to your fleshy duty for the devil? Okay, who's your master now? Who's the boss now? Who's the king now? Who's your boss now? Who's the Lord of your life now? Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. That's what happens. You keep covering your sins, you're never going to prosper. You can keep hiding it forever. But you ever wondered why God never answered your prayer? You ever wondered why that uh, your life is not being blessed by God? You ever wondered why you're not getting fruit? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Oh, no wonder your life is not getting any better recently, right? And even though you heard the preaching and the teaching and you've heard the belief... That, hey, everything's going to be all right. All things work together for good. And God will take care of things. And God will bless you. There's a reward. There's a reward. There's a gain. God will give you joy. God will give you grace. But you don't feel like it. Uh, you wonder why now. Of course those promises are not working and operating when you're what? When you're still messing up with something. God can never bless you until you finally give up your sin and sell yourself to who? The real master. Who's your real master? Or have you forgotten the one who died for you? Did the devil die for you? Did the devil bleed for you? Did the de was the devil whipped for you? Did the devil ever loved you enough that he even said the words, I love you? Or was it God Almighty himself? 
where he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You've got to realize this. If you will not accept that for your salvation, the loving gift of Jesus Christ, his love gift on the cross, then the hatred, yes, hatred, hatred and wrath of God remains on you. How can God love me when I'm burning in hell forever? Simple. He hates you. And all he can see is his wrath on you, not his love. All the love he sees is what he did on the cross of Calvary. That's why all the word that has to do with love connects to the foot of the cross. Unless you can come to that and say, God, I'm nothing without you. I am lost and hopeless without God. And I can't quit all my sins. And I can't do good works to go to heaven or anything like that. All I can do is just trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That alone for my salvation. And you're saved. And if you're a saved Christian, you're still messing around with sin. You better, you better plead the blood. You better confess. You better repent. And yes, you're already saved. You're going to heaven. But God's not judging you for the sins of the soul now. He's judging you for the sins you committed in your body. Because the flesh is not saved. The flesh is unchanged. And the flesh has to reap what it sows. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 1, and we'll finally close the grueling hour, amen? <laughs> we'll finally close the uncomfortable and negative sermon. 1 Kings chapter 1, and verse 50 through 53. Yeah, amen, brother. Woo! That's right. 1 Kings chapter 1, and verse 50 through 53. And Adonijah feared because of Solomon, and arose and went, and caught hold on the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon. For lo, he hath caught hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant with the sword. And you know what happened? Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not an hair of him fall to the earth, but if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and bowed himself to King Solomon, and Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. You know, there's that sword right above your head. Didn't you know that? Didn't you know you're Adonijah? Don't you realize you should tremble before the awesome power of God? And that his chastening rod is like just a few centimeters above your head. And you know, Solomon's weapon was just a couple, couple moments away from Adonijah's head. So you know what he did? He was so afraid that he ran to the altar and grabbed on the horns of the altar. And then he cried out, mercy. You know what you need to do today? At the Holy of Holies, there's that altar. If I were you, I'd run to that altar, grab on its horns, because God's sending the reaper. You reap what you sow. And he's sending that chastening rod, the guy who's going to beat you. And before that person can execute the judgment upon you, I'd run more quickly to the altar before that rod comes down, grab on the horns of that altar in heaven, and cry out, MERCY! And by doing so, what did Solomon the king do? He sent, and he said, Not a hair of him shall fall to the ground, if he show himself a worthy man, and wickedness be not found in him. I'd do that if I were you. And when that altar call opens up, I pray that you today will flee to the horns of the altar, grab it, and cry out, MERCY. Confess and forsake it, and you shall have mercy. Because Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says, But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Mercy! Let that be opened up today. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Perhaps some of you want to flee down onto, onto the altar and cry out, Mercy! Beg and cry to God, mercy, Lord, mercy, mercy. Be sure your sin will find you out. 
God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's no rush. Take time to be holy, as one hymn says. Take time to be holy. I'll give you some time. Today was not an easy sermon to preach on. It's not a sermon that I love to preach on. You think this pastor likes to preach something like this? It's a sobering sermon that you should take seriously and say, God, oh, mercy, Lord. I confess and I forsake. Confess and forsake. Confess and forsake today. Go home and clean up the stuff in your house. Go to your life, self-reflect your life and clean up everything within your spirit. Cleanse yourself all of the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, as Corinthians chapter 7 read. Mercy, Lord. You can hide your sin, but it will be exposed. You can't hide it forever. Oh, you can act pious. You can pretend that you're a King James only, Bible believing, dispensational, fundamental Baptist. Oh, yeah, you can. But you can't hide it forever. And trust me, people may be dumb, but not that dumb because it can't last forever. And it will be shown from your attitude, from your conversation, from what you're spending your time on people are watching you if you're not watching yourself be sure your sin will find you out as one verse says I pray that God will give you time to pray and get some things right with the Lord there's no better there's no better moment than to confess and forsake before that rod slams down right over your head there's no better moment than to just forsake it and to confess it. It's a liberating feeling. It's a liberating moment. It's like, thank you, Lord, for your mercies made new every morning. God, my Father, thank you so much for the preaching of your word. I pray today's preaching has touched and changed people's lives. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And bless the remainder of the fellowship and the Sunday school teaching. And may there be no hindrances or burdens or people who got offended by today's preaching because there was some secret sin in their lives. I pray that hearts will be as one and give you the full glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God and he cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried, and resurrected so that his blood 
can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.